All right, let's do this. I get to record something? That gets my goat. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. I am Big Anklevich and here with me today is... That's your cue, Rish. Oh, I'm sorry, half of the podcasting team was killed by Thanos. (laughs) Oh, shoot. Well, we're going to have to find some way to bring them back. (laughs) Uh, This is Rish Outfield. And spoilers, right here at the very beginning, we're going to spoil this movie like no movie has ever been spoiled. There are credits at the end. That's how badly I'm going to spoil this movie. Yeah, we're going to spoil it so badly, we're going to tell you that there are only credits at the end. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. This is such a big movie. Uh, This is Avengers Endgame we're talking about, by the way. Uh, It's such a big movie, I almost feel like we need a bigger podcasting team to talk about it. Yeah, we probably do. Let, hold on, let me uh, let me make a quick call. All right, uh, joining us now is Renee Chambliss. Welcome to the show, Renee. Yay, I'm so happy to be here. Wow, how about that? And so quick to answer the call, too. Thank you. Well, you know, I'm always ready to answer <laughs> whenever you guys call. Well, that's great, because we're going to call again and again and again. Because <laughs> seriously... Need a little something on this show. <clears throat> so welcome to the big show. It's big now because there's three of us. <laughs> so we're talking uh, Avengers Endgame. I still want to call it Infinity War or Infinity something. Infinity War 2. Yeah. Yeah, and we're going to spoil the heck out of it. So if you haven't seen it and you, you plan to, eventually I would wait and listen to this episode later, because <laughs> there's spoil-worthy things in this. You know, there's things that you don't want to know that are... Yeah, it'd be tough to talk about this movie without spoiling it. Yeah, I saw that a couple of times uh, over the weekend, where people would be like, here's my spoiler-free review. <laughs> I was just like, what are you going to say? Okay, so when did you all see it? I saw it Thursday. Thursday night at 11.45 p.m., and it was after three when I uh, was done. <laughs> oh, man. It's a long movie. <laughs> nice. Uh, I didn't see it until Saturday morning. I saw it Saturday morning at 9.45 a.m. That's worse somehow. Because <laughs> I didn't buy my tickets ahead of time. I didn't do the, uh, you know, a month ago, get on there and, and buy your tickets like... A lot of people did because I think they'd already like broken the record before, you know, for for money made on a movie in a weekend before it, the weekend ever even, you know, was within a week. Uh, that was a terrible way of saying it. But before it even came close, they'd I already... bought mine ahead of time. But did you? Yeah. The main reason was so. I guess two months ago, I saw Into the Spider-Verse with my daughter in L.A., and we saw it at this theater that had the reclining seats where you put your feet up, Uh and that was revolutionary for me. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I never want to see a movie in a theater in another way again. (laughs) So uh, that was down in L.A., and we uh, saw Captain Marvel in a theater up here, which had similar reclining seats with the cup holder and the little uh, tray to put your popcorn. So I thought, okay, that's how I want to watch Endgame. And so I uh, ordered them in advance and chose my seat so that I could do that. Yeah, that's a way to do it. I was stupid and didn't do that. And so at the last, you know, as the weekend was approaching, I think like Thursday night or maybe even Friday, I started looking to see, okay, is there a showing? There should be showing. I can get in somewhere. There's going to be a million showings, right? <laughs> there are a lot of showings. I think they may have added some showings, too, because where where I finally wound up going, they had a showing at 6 a.m. that morning as well. Well, that's what my daughter did. She saw it Friday morning at 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> oh, that was, wow. Yeah. I don't think I would watch... A video of the birth of my child at 6 o'clock in the morning. (laughs) She was so excited, though. And I think I've said this before on the podcast, but that's my recommendation for all of you parents of teenagers. Find something that your kids really like, that you also like, 
and share that with them because she was so excited about this movie coming out. And she had a whole system and a schedule for all the old movies, all the you know former Marvel movies that she wanted to watch before this came out. <laughs> and I mean, she was counting down and she was so into it. And once she was done with it, she said to me, OK, I'm done. I'm dying to talk about it. And I said, no, you cannot talk about it until I see it at <laughs> three this afternoon. Anyway, it's just a cool thing to share. Yeah, my, my kids were the same way. They were they were really into it. My littlest one, who's uh, only seven still, he's been watching the older movies on Netflix, the ones that are on Netflix, yeah. a lot. And he's uh, my wife is is not really interested very much in most of those that stuff, and she hasn't seen a lot of the movies. But now she has mm-hmm. because he's made her sit down and watch them with her. To the point where she really actually wanted to go and see this one. She didn't, (laughs) but she wanted to. Well, maybe she'll go the second time you go see it. (laughs) Yeah. I was saying that it it is likely that I'll I'll see it again because uh, she hasn't seen it. She seemed interested enough that she may actually come with me another time. But yeah, she had planned to redo the entire kitchen. (laughs) She painted all the cupboards. In our kitchen, they're going from like the kind of wood oak looking color to white, antique to white. And she did all that and she insisted that I keep the kids out of the house for as long as possible. And so that's what I did was, yeah, perfect. Three hour movie. There you go. So all of us saw it at different times. Oh, sorry. I have to, uh, what do you call it? Where you have to put something on the record. I've seen the movie twice. You know, the grown-ups saw it on Thursday, and my nephews really wanted to go to it, so we went and saw it on Saturday again. So I, I've seen it twice. But I wanted to ask, how long did the movie feel for you two? I mean, I knew it was three hours, so I planned ahead. Sometimes I run these really long running races, and there's a whole protocol for how you hydrate for these things. Basically, you hydrate and hydrate and hydrate until two hours before, and then you cut yourself off. (laughs) So that's what I did for this. Yeah, I was going to say, I hope you didn't hydrate that much uh, for this, because... No, it's very strategic. So that's what I did. And it didn't feel that long. I mean, I knew going in how long it was. And again, the reclining seats, you're just like (laughs) cradled like a baby. I mean, it's perfect. (laughs) So... Comfort wise, you're all set. You're like Michael Jackson in his little uh, sleeping pod with with bubbles, the chin. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're just like perfectly supported, just looking up and being entertained. So yeah, I it didn't. I mean, I knew it was going to be long, so I think that maybe helped with them preparing for it. And also, I mean, we don't exactly know what's going to happen after this, but it did really feel sort of like an end of an era. So in that regard, you don't really want it to end. So I wasn't impatient at all. I was just happily enjoying everything. Yeah, I felt the same way. I di- it didn't feel long to me. I was worried because I didn't know that it was going to be three hours long. And I was worried that uh, my seven-year-old was not going to make it all the way through without having to go to the bathroom because uh, that's happened to me too many times. <laughs> I've had to uh, miss parts of movies because of that, which a lot of times my wife will, you know, if she's with me, she'll take them because she knows that she doesn't care about it as much as I do <laughs> when we go to stuff <laughs> like that, but not every time. And yeah. I remember being rather frustrated with my daughter, who is now 16 years old, 17 years old, when I went to see Finding Nemo and had to take her out and stand off to the side. I was I was standing out, you know, the exit way where you, you leave, but you can still see the screen if you're if you're standing at the mouth of it. I was like standing there, trying to get her to shut up because she was crying and <laughs> she got bored. She was less than two years old, so. Not a surprise. But. Well, how did your seven-year-old do this time? He made it. Yay. I actually got really worried because the theater we went to had really tall seats. Like the seat mm-hmm. backs were like all the way up to, you know, the top of your head. And he couldn't really see very well over the top of him when he was sitting in his chair. And so I told him, okay, you can sit on my lap. So he comes and sits on my lap. 
he was there for eh, probably like the first 45 minutes to an hour. And then all of a sudden he gets up and I went, oh no, here it is. And instead he went over and sat on his sister's lap for an oh, hour. Good. And then he came back and sat on my lap for an hour <laughs> after that. And, and But he made it all the way through. That's awesome. And I was glad to not not miss anything. Wow. See, that's that's good. I should have anticipated that with you. With me, I anticipated it as well. Because I took my nephew, who is eight, to the boy who would be king in January. And he was just all over the place and wanted to play on his seat and run around. And I was just like, oh, no. This movie is twice as long as that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I saw it the first time... I tried to pay attention to when the story slowed down the most. <laughs> when would be a good time right. to take a break? Right, so I was like, okay. So I chose when they first arrived at Camp Lehigh, that's when I can take him to the bathroom because there's like a two or three mo minute scene there where, you know, they're, they're on the elevator and stuff. Nothing is really happening until Tony starts to talk to his father mm -hmm. outside. And, and I asked him, my nephew, at that point, okay, here it is. You ready? Do you want to, want to run to the bathroom? And he's like, I'm okay. So it was just like you. I, I was really blown away that he managed the, you know, the full three hours. And uh, just maybe it's a testament to how they paced this movie. I don't know. Because I, 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 I feel like these slow parts are at the very beginning. They really take their time at the beginning. And then it starts to speed up more and more and more. But did you feel that was a problem? Because I felt that was so appropriate. I mean, considering the situation they were in. Oh, I, I don't know that it was a problem. I'm just saying for a child. Right. Who, right you right, know, right. looking at it through his eyes, there's a lot more talking and thinking and not fighting at the beginning. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, Big has told me stories of, you know, the moment, the least appropriate moment when his <laughs> kid has to go to the bathroom. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. For us, at least, we went kind of first thing in the morning, so we hadn't had time to, you know, drink a bunch mm -hmm. of water or anything <laughs> like that. So I think that might have helped. But yeah, you know, the start of the movie being so slow, I think it's one of those things that they tend to not do very often in, in movies. You know, they, they, they do like, you have a, a micro moment of grief when something happens, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Luke Skywalker comes back to the homestead and Aunt Beru and, and Uncle Owen have been murdered and burned to a crisp. And he's upset. He grieves for a little bit. But then you move on and then the rest of the movie happens. And he can't be just like moping the whole time. So you have to kind of leave that behind. In this case, half of the universe went away and if and also they failed yeah and they failed to stop it and if they just yeah it's it's okay we can we move on you know we we have to deal with it right and then they, they just went into their adventure and they were never upset or torn up i just really liked that they spent so much time and gave us even a very a bunch of different kinds of grief, you know, or, or kinds of reaction to the grief that would have just overtaken the entire world and the, the universe. And what that would be like to have half of everyone just gone. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that they took that uh, long, slow moment to really bring that home and to really make us understand just how bad things were and how just... And starting with Hawkeye's children and wife disappearing. Oh, yeah, I'd love to have been in the theater with you two and see if your audience reacted the same way. Because as soon as they established that the family was alive, I was just like, oh, shoot, I know when this is. Yeah. Whereas with Ant-Man, at the end of Ant-Man and the Wasp, I had no idea that that was coming. Right. I just felt like, okay, that's your coda for Ant-Man and the Wasp. Whereas with this, it's just like, oh, no. And to hear, like, gasps and people be like, you know, oh, they didn't want it to happen. Yeah. That was great. I, it, it, they, they didn't have to recap Infinity War. They could show somebody else's point of view. And it told you exactly... It reminded you how Infinity War ended and how that felt. 
but uh, sorry, uh, let me rewind and ask Renee a little bit about her history with these characters. And sure, have you seen? So this was how many was this big? Was this a twenty second Marvel Cinematic Universe? Uh, I believe it was twenty second. Yeah. How many of those films have you seen? I have seen most of them. I have not seen all of them. I saw. Iron Man and Iron Man 2. I don't think I saw the Hulk. I saw Captain America. But what I really got into it was the first Avengers. And I saw that and was just like very excited and happy and very engrossed. But I didn't see them all. And it was when Infinity War came out last year. You know, my daughter, as I mentioned, she's into all of this. She was very excited. But my son, who is kind of more cynical, he's not quite as, I guess I'd say, wide-eyed about it all. He saw Infinity War, and he came back, and he was just, like, stunned. (laughs) And he said to me, like, I have never seen a movie like that. Like, you need to see this. And so I went and saw it, I think, the next day. And it was extremely powerful. And and it was kind of cool because I hadn't seen all of them, but I was still able to be very sucked in and moved and entertained and just blown away by it all. So then when um, Captain Marvel was going to come out, my daughter and I went to see it together and were really excited by it. We ended up seeing it a second time um, right before Endgame. And then she, as I mentioned earlier, had this plan to watch and she watched almost all of them before. (laughs) And she's a You know, she's a college student. She's a math major. She has a job. It's not like she has nothing to do, but she had this whole schedule for how she was going to watch them. And so I consulted with her, like, which ones I should see. So I saw A Civil War, Thor Ragnarok, and then she said I should see Age of Ultron. So I saw that. You know, I have uh, Amazon Prime and Netflix. And so what's available on those? it, It didn't totally work, you know, with the whole order of everything. So I bought Ant-Man and I watched that and I wasn't going to see Ant-Man and the Wasp, but then she saw it and she's like, no, you should watch that one. (laughs) And so I did. (laughs) And it turned out it was good to watch all of (laughs) those. Like, I guess the one that I didn't see was Spider-Man, but I felt like seeing Civil War and seeing the whole dynamic between Iron Man and Spider-Man, like it wasn't quite as essential. I mean, I still would love to see that because I found their interactions hilarious and i'm sure it's a very entertaining movie and then right before i went to see endgame i watched infinity war again okay well the the one that you've left out that i feel like for some reason this movie touches them on the most is thor dark world yeah no i haven't seen that that's the one that nobody likes (laughs) um and yet they went back to that movie significantly in this and and Mm -hmm. and i thought that was really neat so what order, when did that come? Because I saw the first Thor. Was that second? That, yeah, that was the second Thor movie. Uh, Thor the Dark World happens it happens after Age of Ultron, is that right? I don't think so. I think it's before Age of Ultron. Because Ragnarok happens right before Infinity War. I mean, and I would happily go see any of them at this point because... I just, I'm so impressed with how well it's all been woven together with the ones I have seen. Yeah, I feel like seeing all the movies can Mm -hmm. only make you appreciate Endgame more. Uh, Maybe with the exception of The Incredible Hulk, all of them reward you, or, you know, having seen, for example, Winter Soldier, or having seen Mm -hmm. the first Avenger, the first Captain America movie, there are lines that are callbacks to that or the whole Paggy Carter dance thing. I don't think you would get quite the same kick out of it if you didn't know that he never got to see her again. Uh, and yeah, anyhow, I just wanted to know your, your background. Is there a favorite Marvel character for you in, or Marvel Cinematic Universe character? For me? Oh, boy. For you, Renee. I have a hard time picking a favorite. I mean... I love the humor. I love when the humor is incorporated. So I think in Infinity War, my favorite scene is the Guardians of the Galaxy when they pick up Thor. I mean, that is just, I just love it so much. And the whole Chris Pratt, Chris Hemsworth. I mean, it's just like, it's so good. And Sweet Rabbit. And (laughs) I love all of that. So um, so I really like that. I love Iron Man because, again, the humor, I guess... um, 
Captain America has been not as favorite of a character for me, although he definitely grows on you as the time goes by. And I think it's because he's just, the reason he didn't appeal to me as much at first was because he's so kind of straight and not, doesn't have the humor that some of the others do. But I listened to your podcast about Captain Marvel. And I have to say, you know, my daughter and I seeing, we saw Captain Marvel together. Well, we saw it separately, but then we saw it again together. And we loved it. And we loved her. So um, I know that, you know, she didn't really resonate with everyone. But for us, we really liked her and liked her humor and her personality and demeanor and all of that. So I guess maybe to jump ahead somewhat, my one teeny, teeny criticism of Endgame was that there wasn't enough Captain Marvel. <laughs> okay, that's that's funny. See, because it's so weird. Me am Bizarro number one. <laughs> Captain America is my favorite character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I was so happy that Captain Marvel left for two hours of that movie. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's not... Well, I be- remember when I listened to you guys talk about it that you were... W- you were worried that she would just sort of solve all the exactly. problems. Exactly, and you know? that's the and, reason um, why I thought it was great that she went away is because she's so powerful. But I wanted to talk to you about that because, honestly, like, yes, she is incredibly powerful, but is she more powerful than Thor, say? You know, I mean, I feel like that the storytellers have done a really good job of making these characters fallible and have flaws. And even though they have incredible powers, like amazing powers, they're not invincible. And so I really didn't have that concern. Like at the end of that movie, I didn't think like, oh, you know, she's just going to do whatever she wants and it's going to be an easy fix. I felt that they would come up with like a kryptonite for her. And they didn't really do that in this. It was more just she was gone. But I still feel like Nobody's invincible, you know, even for superheroes. <laughs> there's always something. I mean, Superman has kryptonite. Like, there's always something. So I think there's more they could do with her. Well, yeah, I'd be interested to see what it is because she doesn't have kryptonite as far as I know. But she is Superman, you know. I mean, she flies in space. She At one point, she used a helmet to do that. But that th- she doesn't use that anymore. Mm-hmm. She just flies. But she doesn't need she that She flies anymore. at basically <laughs> light speed through space. Right. But when she was like Thanos wasn't able to I mean, she couldn't just sort of do whatever to Thanos like he was able to stop her. Yeah, that was kind of surprising at the end. uh, I I can see Thanos stopping her with the gauntlet on because he has I think they, they demonstrated that at the start of Infinity War, just how powerful he was now that he had the I assume it was the power stone. I don't know which stone is which, but now that he had stones, he was able to just wipe the floor with the Hulk. You know, so he's really powerful with the stones. But when we see him, he doesn't have them. Well, and that and was a question. And maybe we're jumping too far ahead. So stop me. We can <laughs> talk about this later. But So are you saying Captain Marvel is your favorite cinematic universe character? I can't pick a favorite. I'm just saying that I really liked her. I like any character that has humor. Like I loved... The Guardians, you know, the whole Thor. I think before all of that, Iron Man was my favorite. Because, again, the humor, that sort of silly, cocky kind of attitude that you can back up with your powers is something that I enjoy. Mm. So It's funny because I'm right there with Rish. My my favorite character is also Captain America. (laughs) Well, I mean, you know, as I said, he grows on you. He grew on me. But, yeah. He just seemed kind of boring in the beginning, but yeah, I yeah just, that's why we have all kinds of tastes and interpretations on all this stuff. Yeah, I think I like him because he has that that very very strong moral center, and he's he's like the heart of everything, you know, or the I don't know the compass the the conscience of the group. Mm-hmm that helps them to go in the right direction. And uh, when, when you're not with him, you're probably making a, a wrong choice. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rish. You were starting to talk. So how full were your screenings? <laughs> uh, I, maybe I should say that I tried to get tickets the day they came out. 
And there were only those awful, awful seats in the very front row. Yeah. Or, or my cousin and I couldn't sit together. We could each sit on like, you know, oh, there's a seat here. And so I, I hoped that it would be like Force Awakens and be like Infinity War. And they would add showings and more and more and more. And I would be able to go to it on opening night despite not being able to get ticket on that first day. And yeah, like two weeks later, I went back to the movie theater and they had added five more shows. And so I could sit wherever I wanted, but it was full. And when we went and saw it on Saturday with the kids, we got there a little bit late because I insisted on taking them to the bathroom. (laughs) And every seat was full. And we had to have all these people who were watching the movie in the dark because the movie starts out really dark stand up and let us all in and uh, and so I wondered yeah what kind of crowd did you see it in because that was something that Big couldn't wait to tell me was the crowd that he saw his movie with Uh, it wasn't so much the size of the crowd that I wanted to talk about but it just how into the movie the crowd was that their reactions made the screening for if I'd gone if I just watched this at home on DVD or done like this guy that I know who gets on like a pirating site and watches it he said he watched it at Starbucks on Thursday morning and he came in on Thursday going yeah I want to talk to you about and I'm like dude no okay no don't just get out of (laughs) here say nothing but if I had done it like that I don't think I would have liked the movie nearly as much as I did I think being in a group of like-minded individuals enjoying it as much as they did made me enjoy things as much as I did. Uh, you know, you watch a stand-up comedian at home on TV and you don't laugh out loud. You watch it and you know, oh, that's funny. Yeah, these jokes are great. But never, ever do you laugh out loud. But you go to that same comedian's show live with a audience and you're laughing out loud the whole time i've only i've only gone to one stand-up comedian uh live and that was david spade one time and man that was so much fun i don't know why i haven't gone back since because it was so much fun to laugh out loud with the audience and it was the same deal with this movie just I actually saw somebody had posted a video on YouTube where it was like the best audience reactions or something like that. And they, I think they just took their phone into the theater with them and like had it recording the audio. And it was just audio the whole time. And the video of it would just say, you know, what was happening. Like, this happens here. You know, like Hawkeye's family disappears. Yeah. And then you hear the audience go, oh, and stuff like that. And... Again, like I I was watching, I was listening to, I guess, this YouTube video while I was at work and their reactions were taking me back into it and almost making me tear up. And I'm like, oh, I can't watch this at work. I'm going to look like an idiot (laughs) crying over here at my desk. Oh, that's great. (laughs) But yeah, that's totally what the experience was for me. The, The theater was pretty full. I did manage to get four seats next to each other which was lucky i think only because it was that really early showing and probably a showing that they'd added later on a la the 6 a.m showing i'm sure that was one that they added pretty late in the game but i wasn't crazy enough to go to that one but yeah i I, (laughs) as i was looking the night before and stuff all i could find was yeah separate seats and i was thinking okay you know, I'm going to have to have the seven-year-old sitting next to us. We're not going to be able to just disperse ourselves all the way through the theater. <laughs> but I was asking my daughter, is it, is it okay if we don't sit next to each other? She's like, come on, no. I'm not. <sighs> so I had to find something for us. I, I wasn't able to go to the theater closest to us. We had to go to one a little further away at the mall. But we did manage to find seats. I think we got the last set of four seats together that weren't all the way at the front, you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was a great crowd. It was a lot of fun to watch it with them. Well, tell me, Big, a little bit about what the crowd did for you. The the biggest oh, gasp of like horror for the whole screening for my group was when the screen goes black and then it goes five. 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 <laughs> oh my gosh. Years. 
yeah. later. later. That was just this gasp of, oh no. And sort of like this <laughs> wave of empathy for the world that I, I thought yeah. was just so cool. Because we had talked for a year of, you know, are they just going to snap their fingers and everybody comes back? What about that poor bastard in the crashing helicopter? What will happen to him? You know, that kind of thing. (laughs) But that, no, people stayed dead for five years. The world had to live with this, with survivor's remorse for five years. And, you know, it really makes me wish that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. hadn't gone off the air for a year. Because I would love to have seen 10 or 15 episodes set in a world where half the population is gone and just like what that would do to the economy and the infrastructure and the government and school and the police and families and stuff like that. And and maybe we'll still see some of that. I don't know. But it's just, they, they show uh, that, is it a baseball field? Yeah, City Field in New York. And it's just... It's like nobody has time for baseball anymore. Yeah, it's, it's all uh, run down and kind of unused. Yeah, I felt like that was really representative of the mindset of the whole world. I guess the whole galaxy is. Yeah, you, you have know, the Ant-Man things... when he reappears and he's running and he down the back. street and there's just garbage. Like it's people aren't even like coming to take the garbage away. Cause it's just piled up on the streets and stuff like that. Just, yeah, how do you go on with that? Well, I didn't record anything, but I had, I wasn't, my theater was full. It was totally full. And I thought that was so fun to watch it with a big crowd like that. In fact, when I was going in and I showed my ticket, the guy taking the tickets, he said, are you excited? I'm like, yes, I'm so excited. (laughs) And it just was so cool to be part of this sort of group excitement about it all. You know, I, I loved seeing it. It was. And I loved being a part of that. And um, at one point, I th- I think it was the five years later, this woman in the theater screams out the S word. <laughs> like, <laughs> and we're just like, yeah, you're right. You know, oh, see, what that, is this? That's so cool. So, I, 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 Renee, you're just a tiny. And I, I apologize if this is rude. It's OK. But you're just a tiny bit older than Big and me. I am. Yes. We're all grown up. Right. I, and I've heard so many people dismiss like, Oh, more comic book movies. I can feel America getting dumber. And that I feel sorry for those people. Come on. It's ridiculous. You know, I mean, they're just like I get it like I like my sister. She's not into this kind of stuff, but she's not going to be putting people down for liking it, but at the same time there are so many people who do. And you know, not to get political, but I just feel like there's a lot of stress in our world right now and to be able to come together for this great story is awesome. Like we need more of that kind of thing. So yeah, well, and no, exactly I... you the re, the point I was trying to make by saying, "Oh, you are so old, Renee," <laughs> is that <laughs> you're ostensibly not the target audience for a you know tentpole blockbuster. Right. Let's appeal to the teenagers kind of movie, and yet you and your daughter, who is in that demographic can both appreciate it together. And it it sounds like it's brought the two of you closer. Yes. It's been a way to stay close through these, in some cases, turbulent years. I mean, in our case, it hasn't been. But I think that's been awesome, like to find these things that we can both love and share. And, you know, she sends me, she sent me um, today all these vines do you guys even follow Vines? Like, Vines is not something that my generation is that... <laughs> Vines still exist? <laughs> I'm sad that they do. Well, no, they... It's sort of a almost a hipster retro thing amongst <laughs> these Gen Z kids <laughs> where they, like, look up these old Vines and they see them on YouTube and there's these compilations of Vines where they have assigned different characters from Endgame to these Vines. <laughs> and it's pretty funny. I can uh, provide you those links if you'd like to see them. But any, but my point is, she texts me these, like, check these out. These are so funny. And, you know, and it's, you know, she's down in L.A. I'm up here in Northern California. It's a way for us to still interact and be close. And so, yeah, it's awesome. That is cool. So so the, the point I was trying to make is that, that there are people that dismiss these movies as juvenile trash. But according to Box Office Mojo... 61% of the people that went to see this movie 
its opening weekend were 25 years or older. Yeah. And that seems to fly in the face that th- these are movies for teenagers or kids. You'll hear that too. It's just like, why are adults caring about little kid movies? I'll see a grown man with a, you know, Hulk t-shirt and it just makes me shake my head. I, I feel like a little boy again when I see these movies. Mm-hmm. And then the movie lets out and you have to go back to your job and put on a tie or a headset or, you know, whatever awful <laughs> accoutrement <laughs> goes with your job. But for three hours and two minutes, I was a little boy again. And I got to experience the movie on the same level as my eight-year-old or 10-year-old nephews next to me. And I don't know, he brought us closer because we, we had to drive... 45 minutes both ways to see Endgame. Mm-hmm. And so the whole drive up, I was asking them questions about, you know, the stones. And I, I was trying to prepare them for the movie, trying to remind them of things that, that would get touched on again in this movie. It was just like, okay, how did they get that stone on Voromir? What did what did Thanos have to do and, and stuff? And it was really neat to hear a child's perspective of yeah. him saying, well... He loved Gamora, even though he was bad, but he had to kill her to be able to get it. And I was just like, okay, so the kid gets it. Right. And, and, and I don't know, seeing these things through the eyes of kids makes me love them more. And we talked about that with Star Wars a bunch of times, of seeing it with somebody that you love. I don't know, you experience it differently now. Because it's almost like a, a psychic thing of... I am now seeing it through my kids' eyes instead of my own eyes. And maybe it's just empathy. In the same way that when your daughter gets married, you will remember how it felt and experience it through her. And it's, it, it, I don't know, it's like you, you are experiencing it again for the first time. I just feel like, you know, the older I get, the less I care about the whole like, oh, this is just for grownups or this is just for boys or this is just for whoever. You know, it shouldn't matter. Life is hard and being able to love stories and be super into things, that makes the world better. That makes our lives better. So, you know, those people who are like, oh, why do you? I mean, honestly, I haven't really seen much of that. I'm on my Twitter and Facebook and all of that. Like, it's been more like, oh, my gosh, like no spoilers. But wow, you know, it's been that kind of thing. And maybe a couple of people like, yeah, I haven't watched any of these movies, so I have no idea what you're talking about. But no, like, why do you guys care? These are just for kids. Like, I haven't seen that. And the thing about it is, even if it was for kids, I mean, how long ago did the first Iron Man come out? It's been, you know, what, 11 years? So those kids are now adults. I just love that it's something that brings us together right now. Yes, absolutely. It has brought me so much closer to my nephews Mm -hmm. that they love something that I love. Yeah. And I know Big has talked about his son really liking, you know, the the action figures and all that stuff. And it's just like, well, yeah, I love them too. Anyhow, that's that's something that's neat. And I like that you haven't surrounded yourself by the ugh people. And maybe there's not a lot of those people but they're just the few that there are. They have very loud microphones. Yeah, the loud voices. But another thing that's neat about the three of us, besides that we're old, is that all three of us are writers. Wait, being old is neat? <laughs> it's, it's the best. Oh. I missed that memo. I, maybe I didn't mean neat. Uh, maybe I meant the other thing. Terrible. No, I meant the, something unique about us. <laughs> but we're... We're writers, and as, as a writer with all of these characters, and this movie had more characters than any movie I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like when they made the greatest story ever told, and I think that was Cecil B. DeMille, and he like populated the whole movie with stars in cameos or whatever. That had nothing <laughs> on this. And yet the Russo brothers found a way to give almost everybody something interesting to do an emotional beat a cool superpower beat a neat fight beat a laugh and that is an astounding achievement as a writer i just always like wow how did you do that and i i remember being so impressed when joss whedon did that in 2012 with avengers and that was a third the characters 
Yeah. <laughs> it was a hundredth the characters yeah. <laughs> that were in this thing. <laughs> yeah, it was so impressive and so well done. Big talk for a minute, man. <laughs> okay, are, are we ready to go into stuff now? I mean, we've talked mostly about the experience of having watched the movie and not so much about the movie itself. And I mean, obviously we've touched on it a little bit, but are, are we ready to move on, do you think? Or are we, uh, is there more still that you want to know? Oh, no, I, I'm just trying to steer the conversation in, in places where the answers might be interesting. Okay. But just you drive for a little while and we'll see uh, okay. where we go. All right. So who would you guys say is our, I mean, we did say that there were dozens and dozens and dozens of characters, but who are our main characters in this movie? We've got, basically we have our original Avengers. They're the ones that have survived the snap for the most part, with a few other exceptions. I would say that probably Iron Man, Captain America are, again, our main two characters in this film. They're the ones with the most to do, the most going on. What did you guys think, for example, five years later, and Iron Man now has a child that appears to be five years old? I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, he, He definitely moved right along when he moved on. Well, I would think that everybody that survived would have done that. (laughs) <laughs> because suddenly you realize how precious life is. And maybe not everybody had a significant other that survived. But he is just like, yeah, being Iron Man is a chapter in my life that is over. Being a hero is over. And I'm going to make the best of the time that I have left. Yeah, I don't know. It seems to me a little weird that that's what he did. Because he is Tony Stark. You know, he is one of the biggest minds in the world and it seems like he would be pretty instrumental in recovery but i guess maybe not his whole what he went through was extraordinarily traumatic i mean basically being abandoned in space and running out of air and food and thinking he's going to die so i could see there being some effects from that whole experience that might make him less likely to want to try to fix things and more likely to sort of retreat inward. Yeah, just want to live. Yeah, yeah and, and I guess the heroes, they, they weren't, you know, government types. They weren't running things. They were just, they were they were like the maid. I, I just clean this place up. <laughs> Can it stay clean for a minute? I thought the whole Captain America leading the support group was a little more surprising. Than yeah, that was... That was also strange, I thought. Was that not a callback to Winter Soldier where Falcon had a support group and he invites Cap to come and and watch? Maybe. I don't remember that scene, to tell you the truth. (laughs) Must have been. But yeah, it just, it it was interesting. The weird thing I thought about it was that, I don't know, what was there, like eight people sitting Mm -hmm. around in a circle there or something like that? One of them happens to be Captain America, but none of these people seem phased or affected by the fact that Captain America is just sitting there with them. You know what I mean? It's it's like, oh, I went to my AA meeting today and turns out Lady Gaga was, was one of the people there and nobody cared. You know, it just seemed a a little odd. And at first you think, oh, maybe these people don't know. But then he goes, yeah, I went into the ice in 45 and came back out. And so, okay, so they know. All right. (laughs) Well, and the one who was really clinging to the old roles was Black Widow. You know, she was. And I thought that was interesting. And I'm interested to hear your perspectives on that because I've heard about how her character has sort of evolved from the beginning and to me it sort of seemed like she was kind of the heart of it all in this movie. I agree that Iron Man and Captain America were the main characters but she was the leader of the Avengers at that sort point. of her kind of trying to hold it together even though there wasn't a lot to hold together you know but to still try when no one else was really there. I found that powerful. Yes, she seems to have grown so much 
and you see her in that leadership position and she's just like giving the orders there. And then once the people are gone, then you see like the weight of the world that's on her shoulders Mm -hmm. and you get the impression that this has been going for so long and she only has so much left to give before, you know, she has some kind of breakdown and, and, and Thor is the opposite. Thor broke down from the very beginning and he's not even Thor uh, anymore. He's just... What's, what's his secret I, identity's I, I name? Think he, well, Don Blake. <laughs> but I think he said, I lost. I'm a loser. Right. And that's what he becomes. Like, I mean, he, he seems to have taken it the hardest, unless you want to say Hawkeye took it the hardest right, by going he... out and sl- slaughtering people. Well, but Hawkeye wasn't involved with the Infinity War fight, whereas Thor, I mean, Thanos tells him, you should have gone from the head. And so I think that's kind of what he takes. Like, it, had I done that, none of this would have happened. Yeah. So it is personal for him. Oh, I really felt for Thor. We, we talked about those other two as the two main characters, but Thor had so much emotional growth in this film, and then they, they basically just stop the movie to have him have a conversation with his dead mother, which I loved. I loved that scene. And I'll bet I will talk to somebody in the next month that says that redeems Thor the Dark World. Because you'll hear over and over again that that's the worst of the movies. I never had a problem with it. I I liked Thor the Dark World. Neither did I. Mm -hmm. But that scene with his mother, and she seems to know a heck of a lot more than she lets on. And she's just there for him. He needs her one last time, Mm -hmm. even though this is her last day on Earth or Asgard. Oh, gosh, I loved that. And I love that they didn't gloss over that, that they took their time with it. Hemsworth, besides being an incredibly handsome guy, really showed some range in Infinity War and Endgame. This guy can act. So were you guys bothered in this movie by Thor's... (laughs) dramatic change because I thought it was funny and believable and all of that. But I was reading some places where they're like, oh, that was ridiculous and over the top and unnecessary. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people complain about it since the weekend has passed. That I've heard even somebody equate it to like what Luke Skywalker's change was in uh, when we finally find out what he's doing in The Last Jedi basically saying that it was contrary to his character that his character wouldn't have done that but i didn't feel that way personally i you know at a certain point like through his history the dark world is the last time you get thor as the proud cocky confident and you know unstoppable kind of a guy and then they start to just destroy him in movie after movie he loses a little more and a little more and a little more and a lot more. And uh, in, in Infinity War, it seemed to me like everyone, uh, they left you, you know, they, they cut off the end of Ragnarok with Thanos' ship arriving and then hop in at the start of Infinity War with Thanos' ship having decimated everything. And... In my mind, it seemed like, okay, Asgard's gone. I, everyone, you know, they, they talk about that at the end of Ragnarok. Like, Asgard is a people and we're wherever we are is Asgard or whatever. And then it's like, okay, well, Asgard's gone because all those people are dead. Apparently not totally because they did have enough to make a town. And we, we never saw Valkyrie in Infinity War, but apparently she made it through. So that's good. Um, but yeah, they took his father you know first they took his mother then his father then his brother for real it seems although who's to say um (laughs) (laughs) they took his hammer and they took his eye yeah they took his hammer his hair his beautiful hair his hair his hair oh his beautiful hair you know just (laughs) everything from him and you know at a certain point it's too much even for somebody who's a god It's going to be too much and you're going to break down and you're going to... Well, especially when right before half of everyone is gone, you make the wrong choice. Yeah, and he was supposed to be the savior. 
he went and forged this axe and he was you know the one that came in the knight riding in on the white horse at the end and he was there to save lightning everybody. crackling and, and right there yeah, and it ready to go didn't happen and he failed yeah. in the end and with such repercussions that's going to really uh take somebody down and so yeah and i i loved the part where he cuts off thanos's head and everybody's like whoa oh geez why did you do that and he's his voice is already breaking. He's like, I was I went for the head. Well, and I think that's why that whole five years later thing had such an impact because here we are at the very beginning of a movie and we know Thanos is who they're trying to get and they get him and it doesn't yeah, matter. It makes no difference. I, I guess we got on this because we were talking about Nat about uh, Black Widow. Yeah, it's just it, it's really neat to see growth with her character and I, I i hate to jump to the end but i had no idea they were going to kill off black widow i felt like all the pieces were building toward them killing hawkeye yeah because he you know he could join his family now or he could trade his life for his family coming back which is a trade that any of us would do you just like of course of course I'll do that, so you can bring my family back. I won't see them, but I will rest knowing that they will live again. All, anybody would do that. It's such a noble reason to go out. And then she dies. And it's just like, holy crap. I thought there was going to be a Black Widow movie next year. Why did you guys do this? And I love that they haven't announced that. Because it sort of took the finality of Spider-Man's death away from Infinity War when we knew, no, next year there's a new Spider-Man movie. (laughs) They should have just lied and said, oh, Spider-Man Far From Home takes place before Infinity War, guys. Don't worry about it. He's Right, it's a prequel. We we all love prequels. Uh, Well, they should have just said that. Yeah. But anyhow, they, they kill Black Widow and it's the the choice of I'm going to die. No, I'm going to die. And then they fight. It was really, really cool. But you, I didn't want either of them to win. Right. Yeah, they're fighting over who's going to be the one. And then there's that shot. And it's, it's, it's kind of awful of her at the bottom. And there's, it wasn't her hair, was it? I mean, it was like this big no, it was blood. spray of blood. Blood. It's sort of a graphic. Uh, no, she is gone. There's no coming back from this kind of thing that, that I thought was, I, I hate to use the word neat. I guess I, I mean, no. it's just, it, it was, it, it was grown up in a slap in the face sort of way. Uh, whereas turning to Ash is a little bit more fantastic way to die. You know what I mean? Where it's just like, yeah, okay, that, that's magical. Right. It seems like that could possibly be undone. Whereas these other deaths I mean, Gamora in Infinity War, I didn't think was coming back. And she kind of did, but not exactly. Well, the, the death that it was the most like in my mind was Loki's death at the beginning of Infinity War, where it's like, that's right. how a person actually chokes to death. Did you see his eyes? Oh my yeah. gosh. What an awful, unglamorous way to die. And it's, it, it is it's just, oh, it's shocking in its banality. If, is that a fair way to, to put it? Yeah. And so... Yeah, that I could not have predicted. Big and I talked about making a pre-end game episode where we talked about who is going to go, what we thought might happen, and that never occurred. But I'm glad because yeah, I would. Once I, they were both going after the Soul Stone, I knew that it was going to be one of them, and I thought it was going to be her. Oh, you did? Okay. Because I felt that. Sorry, my voice is not good, which is. That's your- Not great, because I have a ton to record tomorrow, but we won't worry about that right now. But anyway, um, I was, I'm getting over being sick. Anyway, I just felt that they would want him to be back with his family. Like, she was kind of alone in a sad way. Like, I mean, she had Absolutely. her friends in the Avengers, but other than that, like, she didn't really have other connections, whereas he totally did. So if, if they're trying to succeed in bringing these people back— then it's sort of pointless for him to die because one of the reasons they're wanting to bring people back is so that they can 
reestablish these relationships that they had before. Yeah, I I just found it weird because, yeah, like Rish said, you know, I suppose they haven't actually announced it, but they've all but announced that there is a Black Widow movie, a solo Black Widow movie to come. And yeah, when they got to that point, I was just like, well, she, she can't be the one that dies, that uh, ruins mm. things. The, then that can't happen. I suppose there's always prequels. Exactly. Prequels are always an option. Or time travel. I mean, characters die and come back to life an awful lot in these uh, these movies. How many times has Loki died? So as a quick aside, the biggest cheer in my theater was seeing Loki. <laughs> like, Oh, yeah. I think he first appears when Thor is going back to see his mom. And just that shot of Loki... I think he's like kicking back, maybe eating something. Right. <laughs> and everyone's he's like, laying yeah. in his cell so, as they um, tiptoe past. Yeah. <laughs> the moment when they revisit the 2012 Avengers and, and we continue past where that movie ended was so much yeah. fun. It was just like a, a deleted scene that we didn't know existed where the movie continued. And then when he gets the Tesseract and disappears, oh, I just felt such joy because that's technically an out, a way exactly. to bring Loki back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but, but still saying, no, Thanos killed him. He really killed him. You know what I mean? And I, I, that, right. in the right. same way that Gamora is back, but it doesn't cheapen that Thanos killed her. He really did right. kill her. Right. That Gamora is This is, is a different gone. Gamora. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's brilliant. Again, on the filmmakers' parts, the writers' parts, that they could go back and revisit and sort of do a greatest hits of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in this movie and bring back a bunch of people that we would never have thought to see again. Like to, when Robert Redford steps out, I was just <laughs> like, oh, wow. Yeah. That's so weird. I know. <laughs> just stuff like that is really, really cool. And she, the S.H.I.E.L.D. guys come in to get the Tesseract, and it's guys that we know from Winter Soldier, and it sets up a reprise of the elevator scene. And boy, the audience reaction when Cap said, Hail Hydra. It was, it was so, so <laughs> cool. And yeah, Loki disappears with the Tesseract, and it's just like, oh, shoot. And he had so little to do in this movie, but it was cool to give him to just say, okay, we opened the door just a little bit, that Loki might still be out there. And I, I, I love that. Yeah, it was great. We've been going for an hour and a half. I've thought about a hundred different things as, as we've been leading up to this conversation. I, I know that I haven't gotten them all. But uh, I do have one story that I want to talk about that goes with the finale of the movie. Okay, I'm going to stop my recording now. So. That Gets My Goat will be continued next time. Run while you still can! Oh, sure. I remember podcasts. <laughs> there was this one called That Gets My Goat. I heard from time to time. That show was produced under this thing called a Creative Commons Attribution No Derivatives 3.0 License. A bit of a mouthful for an old man like me, but it basically meant that you could download the show, listen to it, share it with others free of charge, but you couldn't claim it as your own. <laughs> ah, podcasts. We didn't know, back in the day, of course, that it all would end. Not then. It still seems like yesterday, uh, but it ain't. Renee, let me record an outtake for this episode. Because <laughs> I hear people all the time say that Superman is boring. Mm -hmm. Because he's a Boy Scout, because he's, you know, all that. Do you feel that same way about Superman? No. Is it Cap's character, you know, his do the right thing all the time, there's no gray, everything is black and white. Is that what's boring to you? Well, okay, again, like, I mean, come on, these are all shades of gray. Like, if you're 
If you ask me to rank the characters, I would say Captain America is not one of my favorites, but that doesn't mean I don't like him or think he's bad. But here's the difference in my mind. Superman has Clark Kent. So Clark Kent provides the humor, provides the sort of the relatable quality that regular people can sort of identify with. So he has that side of him. And I personally don't see that as much in Captain America. Although, you know, I remember back to the first one where he's so thin and so, you know, not super at that point. So, you know, I get that too. But with Superman, especially, and I'm not as familiar with sort of the current state of Superman. Like my my whole take is the whole Christopher Reeve Superman. Just be grateful. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, that was one of the best parts of it in my mind is seeing seeing him kind of bumbling around and pushing his glasses up and all of that. You know, this he's still Christopher Reeve, but he's not Superman at that point. Okay. Well, and and I was just curious because uh, I I've heard that for years. It's like, oh, nobody wants to see a Superman movie because he's boring. Everybody loves Batman and nobody loves Superman. And I love both. I think it's totally possible to love both. I I totally agree and I I would fault that with the storytellers, not with a character. Like, I think you can make any kind of character interesting and relatable, but it takes an effort. And just powers on their own doesn't make us identify with them. You know, there has to be something else. And having them be sort of more human and flawed, I think, helps us connect. Okay. And and now back to the show proper. I press the button... You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. 